All right. Here's my pocket square. It's orange today. I chose this pocket square because the cover to my new book, Scorch, has orange writing on it. I'll show you the cover right now. And here it is. The arrows, the quiver, <clears throat> maybe you know what that is. Maybe you don't, it's not important. The last video you saw had, well, this is the truth. I had a video recorded before this one. Um, had a lot of different pictures, a slight video itself of hats and beautiful um, picture of some statues. I'm thinking this video in between. So there's another video that I made a couple of days ago that describes what all of that is. What I did today, what we're doing right now, is passionate. Uh, it's, <laughs> I, I released a book five hours and 29 minutes ago. I was gonna let it go, talk about it in a blog, but it's grabbed me. Has anything ever grabbed you? You just have to talk about it. <clears throat> it's too important. Not only, not, it's not about sales. It's about what this book says. It's too important for you to just wait. So what we're gonna do is one, two, and three. And in three, there are pictures and there is a video that I'm supposed to be talking about right now. I already filmed that, that episode when I talked about it. <clears throat> I had a very well folded pocket square of gray and black right here. But I'm going to wait. I'm going to take that, put it in next week. And this week, we're going to talk about PTSD. They didn't used to call it PTSD. They used to call it shell-shocked. I think sometimes you get a, as, as things get more well understood, <laughs> as psychiatrists study something more and more, they come up with different terms. Shell-shocked is a term that <clears throat> is from Vietnam. It's from a term that's from <clears throat> World War II, Korean War. When somebody has just seen something so terrible something so terrible has happened to them that their brain is forever broken. You can go to therapy for shell shock. And I'm no authority. So maybe, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. But I did, I did 19 years of therapy and I never got over my PTSD. He stopped calling it shell shocked because shell shocked is too violent 
of a word and they changed it to four letters, four letters that don't really capture what you're talking about. PTSD, post-traumatic shock syndrome. Like disorder, post-traumatic shock disorder, PTSD. That's, that's what we're talking about tonight. That's why five hours after I released this book, Scorch, I had to come out here, even though I already had a video filmed and I had to talk about it. I'm not gonna tell you about the pictures and the video that were in the one before this. And I'm not gonna talk about the one that will come after this. None of that is important. You, you gotta understand none of that is important. What's important is that today, today, Guardian bought a new knife. Looks like him, doesn't it? It looks like him. I didn't do a proper draw. I'm not, I'm not Guardian. If it was Guardian, I mean, I've seen him practice with this knife. He pulls it out and it, the blade is less than a second. Listen, um, we're going to talk today about shell shock. We're going to talk about PTSD. I'm going to read you a little bit. And then I'm going to talk about Scorch because Scorch is not a book that just tells a fantasy story. Scorch has a Scorch has a has a tale to tell. We're gonna find that tale tonight. Um I gotta get a couple things lined up. I'm gonna go to Teardrop Road and I'm gonna go to Scorch itself. I'm going to give you a little bit of a taste of PTSD. Um, I don't know how, how long this video is going to be. I had a couple of rum and cokes, but I feel pretty strong. I don't feel confused. <clears throat> I don't feel fuzzy. What I feel right now, what's going through my mind is I feel, I feel righteous. Let's go from there. I feel, I feel righteous. But you can tell from the lighting that I have something I'll read for you. Um, I have a second screen. That second screen has a lot of white on it. It's causing a bright, it's causing a bright light to come to me. <clears throat> Let's talk for a minute about how I, why I wrote this book, why I wrote Scorch. Have you seen the movie Walk the Line? It's the Johnny Cash movie. There's a part where he's in the um, recording studio and he's trying to get people to listen to his work, maybe record something on an album for him. He wants to be, he wants to be a, a singer. He's got a 
um, what do you call it? Religious. Uh, he's got a religious song. I can't think of the name. What they call it? A gospel. He's got a gospel. And he sings it. And it's it's dead on the table. Not only is it dead on the table, but it's all skin, bone, and gristle. There's nothing worth listening to here that he's performing. And the guy stops him, the guy in charge of the place that's supposed to record the album stops him. And he says, do you have anything else? And the guy's like, and Johnny's like, um, what do you mean? And he says, I can't record this. I can't sell this. I don't record stuff I can't sell. And he's like, wait, and Johnny's like, wait a minute. You listen to us for one minute and you tell us we can't record. And he goes, yeah. And he says, is it the way I sing or is it the song itself? And the, the recording studio guy says, it's both. And he goes, what do you mean? And he goes, I don't believe you. Johnny immediately is like, um, you don't believe that I believe in God? And he goes, and the recording studio go, guys, I know, you know exactly what I mean. I don't believe you. And then the recording studio guy, the guy who's about to make Johnny Cash what we know him to be, the recording guy says, if you were hit by a truck and you were in the gutter and you had time to sing one song, one song to tell the world <clears throat> what your life meant, one song to tell God what you thought of your time on earth. Are you telling me you would sing that song? He goes, because I'll tell you, that gutter song is the kind of song that people want to hear. That gutter song is the kind of song that saves people. Well, he's got a bassist and he's got a lead guitar. They came in here with a plan. They knew what songs they had. And what they didn't know was that Johnny had more. And Johnny... Johnny starts very slow singing Folsom Prison Blues. As he starts to sing it, the bassist starts to create something because he didn't know that Johnny even had the song. He's never heard this song before. And the bassist starts to create something. And at a certain point, Johnny sang enough that he needs a guitar solo. And he turns to his guitarist. And he's got this look on his face like, please follow me. Please have something. And the guitarist writes the um, guitar solo for Folsom Prison Blues with which anybody who's heard it, if you... <laughs> Even if you have heard it, go back and listen to it again. Because you're going to realize this guy wrote this on the fly. He wrote this without hearing the song at all. It's brilliant. He just creates. So I've been obsessed with clips from that particular part of the movie Walk the Line. And I haven't known why for a while. And then I remembered this memory when I was a kid, my stepfather Mumble and my mom Rose would sing country music and he had a guitar he would play. 
and one time they played Folsom Prison Blues, and I came and I sang. I stood right next to the head of the guitar and I sang. I was, I'm, t- I'm telling you guys, I was probably seven. And that song goes pretty low. It goes lower than all tenors and it goes lower than most bass. And I hit those low notes. Well, they thought it was beautiful, not nah, nah, novelty. And they would, anytime they'd play, they'd take the guitar around to friends' houses and family's houses and they'd play and they'd have me come up. Oh, oh it's novelty. This kid can hit the bass of Folsom Prison Blues. And they'd have me sing it. They stopped after a while. I don't know if they stopped because they didn't want to shine the spotlight on me or if they realized that as I sang Folsom Prison Blues, I understood its sadness. But they stopped having me sing Folsom Prison Blues. It's an important song to me. Folsom Prison Blues is Johnny Cash's gutter song. With the stories that I have to sell, the stories that I have to sing, the stories I have to tell, there's a lot of gutter songs. Scorch needs to be on that list. Because Scorch talks about PTSD. Scorch talks about what it's like to live after you've been abused. After you've seen true horror. Just like Folsom Prison. I'm going to read you a couple of things. Did I tell you yet that today Guardian got a new knife? It's it's utilitarian. It looks like it's wearing armor. And he can pull it and draw it in less than a second. He got that today in celebration of the release of Scorch. If anybody knows about PTSD, it's Guardian. PTSD is what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to read you a chapter from Teardrop Road. And then I'm going to read you a chapter from Scorch. Um, We're going to talk about PTSD today. And we're going to talk about why Scorch is so important to me. Because... I've been through all the abuse. You know, when you get hit so many times by an adult that it to them becomes just a thing to do. You're sitting on the couch watching TV. They happen to be walking by, so they just hit you. And you take it. And after a while, you start out, you stop asking why. You stop crying. You just go back to the television show that you're watching. You just go back to the MTV music video that you're watching. That's PTSD. Because from now on, when an adult walks past you, you brace for it. 
you wait for the hit. We're going to talk about PTSD today because um, you have to look at it. Shell shocked. You have to look at it. You have to look at the fact that a lot of people that you are walking past on the street, when they see you walking towards them, there's a part of them that braces for a hit for no fucking reason. There's a part of them that braces for a hit. And you didn't do anything. You weren't even thinking about that person. You were just walking past them. But they're so used to being hit. They're so used to being in danger that that is what happens to them. So, okay. So I'm, let's say I'm working in a cubicle. No matter how much I try to rearrange my cubicle, my computer is here, desk here, and right back here is the door that leads to my cubicle. I'll be walking and somebody will come up behind me. If I have PTSD, the moment I know they're there, I go into defense or offense. And I'm ready to do real physical harm to that person who just came in to tell me about a meeting they're thinking about bringing me into. That person's just thinking about the meeting. This person here at this desk has to think about the meeting and they have to emotionally regain control of themselves because they have PTSD. And it can be pulled in by anything. Um, the smell of tea. Somebody smells tea brewing and it reminds them of a traumatic event and all of a sudden, they're ready to kill the next person that walks in the room, or they're ready to crouch on the floor and beg not to be beaten, not to be any number of things. You, as the viewer of this video, are walking around people all day long that are dealing with this thing. Scorch is the book that I used to discuss PTSD. Because if you're gonna write something and you want people to pay to read it, you'd better say something worth reading. If I write something and I don't, have something to say, whether it be in my autobiography or fantasy work. If I don't have something to say when I write it, then what the, what the fuck are we doing here? I've been given the ability, the talent, and I've honed the ability to write. If I have nothing to say, and what I'm writing, then why should I ask you to read it? I'm gonna ask you to read Scorch by the end of this. By the end of this, I'm gonna ask you to read Scorch. Me and my orange pocket square are gonna ask you to read Scorch. And every time I get upset, I'm gonna look at the dog over there on the chair that's sleeping. He's gonna call me because Jordi is a therapy dog for me. Every now and then,
I'm going to pull this blade. To calm myself down. We're going to talk about PTSD today. We're going to talk about the reason you should read Scorch. We're going to talk about how it's not a fantasy book. It's a book about somebody trying to put themselves together. I want you to give me one moment to regroup. I got to change out some drinks. I got to get ready to do what I'm about to do. Give me one minute to get myself together and I'll be right back. Okay, let's jump right into it. What you need to know is that I lived next to a child named Cage who was abused by his father and his sister ran away. I don't know details. I'm not gonna guess. All that I know is that she ran away because of her father. So here's a chapter from Teardrop Road. It's called First Blood. When you're a boy growing up in the year 1985, there's so many cool things going on around you. But of all these cool things, nothing exists that is as pure and as righteous as Rambo. Me and Cage adored Rambo. He was our hero. We were growing up with the ramifications of Vietnam. Many of our uncles had fought in Nam. Cage's dad had been there. We were finding out about Agent Orange and his side effects. We didn't understand the war, and that was part of it too. No one knew. No one could explain this horrifying event that gripped the generation before us. We didn't have many answers, but we had a few. The government had fucked up. The troops were not to blame for the horrors that were visited upon them or the horrors that were forced, they were forced to commit. And it was all the Russians' fault. This was what we were told. This is what we knew. They didn't call it PTSD back then when they talked about the way the men above us would shake and tremble. They called it shell shock. It was a raw term, a term that left no denials. It wasn't a grouping of letters that was easily misunderstood or waved off. This was real. Shell shock was why we were not allowed to walk up on our trash man from behind. It was the reason why the lunch man at our school would whimper every now and then when you said hello to him. We were being raised in the aftermath of an atrocity and we were trying to make sense of it. Rambo did that for us. When I tell you that I was nine, that when I was nine, me and Cage went to the theater to watch Rambo 2. You will think our parents terrible for letting us watch the violent film at such an impressible, impressionable age. They were not. They were helping us understand the time we were living in. Murdoch, I'm coming for you, was the very voice of our generation as we fought for a way to get some sort of closure on Vietnam. We came home from that movie and me and Cage went to our corners. I went to my room, him to his. We sat on that story, that violence. We let the blood in the jungle roll around and are not in our minds. By the next day, we were ready. Cage and I were the boldest of the neighborhood kids. What we said usually happened. So the next day when we knocked on every door and called out every boy, they came when we told them to grab every toy gun they had and come to Cage's house, they obeyed. All the guns were set on the grass, every one of them. We were Rambo boys, so we had a lot of guns, rifles, handguns, machine guns, and even the rocket launcher the rich kid up the street had gotten from Toys R Us was thrown on the grass. Cage stood uphill as the rest of us stood down and he pointed at us and he said, we're going to have a war. He planted his fists on his hips and he grinned. The winner gets to keep one of these guns. What do you mean? A kid said. We're going to bet a gun that we win. You're going to bet a gun that you win, Cage said. I don't want to play this game, the rich kid said. How about walk? Do you want to be able to walk? Or do you want to stumble around on crutches? Cage said, holding up a fist. Fine, the boy said, dejected. 
You guys win. You get to have this, Kane said, picking up his M16. It was matte black, and when you pulled the trigger, it made a loud, whirling chugga-chugga that were chugga-chugga sound that we were sure was exactly what a machine gun would sound like. If we win, we get the, the rocket launcher is ours, Cage, had, Cage said. In this story, both times I have written the words rocket launcher, I've capitalized them. This is not because I'm a sloppy typer. This is not an accident. I did that because to type it any other way would be an abomination. This was not a toy. This was a work of art. Perfect rendering of the rocket launcher from the movies, complete with the big knobby conical pointy part that we all love to look at so much. It was more than a gun. It was a lifestyle and the only real thing me and Cage wanted. Do not worry, Cage said with a lunatic's grin. The teams won't be fair. He laughed. And I saw him as if for the first time, big and tough and rumbling. The toughest kid I ever knew. The boy I wished I was. Cage was in that moment more than a boy. He was the king of boys. A violent Peter Pan with a nightmare of a father and a missing sister. He was a myth. A boy riddled as if by bullets with reasons to be weak. A boy under pressure. A god boy. You will all be one army, Cage said. Me and Jesse will be the other. My heart stopped. No, uh, no, I stuttered. We need more than two. We need two more, just two. I looked out at the sea of boys, easily nine other boys who could ruin me in Cage. And I fought frantically to find one Cage might agree to, but I knew it wouldn't. Cage didn't trust anyone but me. Not his mother, not his sister, not his brother or his father. None of his friends except me had his back. We'd been in fights together. When we got on the fight in the bridge, he'd been kicked into the street in front of a moving car, and I jumped out after him to pull him back up. We had both been nearly killed, but we'd survived. Groups of kids had come at us talking about his father, and side by side, we'd lay them on their backs. We'd fought older kids. We fought teenagers. We'd be both been in night fights by the time we were eight. There was no foe that we could not face together. I had two people I could count on. He was one of them. I knew we wouldn't let any other on our team because we the only team we had. We were it. It was me and Cage. We faced it all together. When I think about where he is, I get a feeling in my fists. I get an itch that makes me want to punch something. Right now, I know Cage needs me. He needs the guy who jumped in front of a car to save his life. Cage needs his fighting partner to help him fight the jungle he finds himself in, but he went somewhere I could not follow. This day, however, he pointed at the other kids and he told them the rules. No one goes off the block. You cross into the street, you lose automatically. You can go through alleyways all you want, but this is the war zone right here. Leave and you lose. Each army gets a base. This is their POW camp. Once you are brought here, you obey. No breaking out. You lost. You have to deal with it. Those boys still over in Nam can't expect, can't escape. You can face what they are facing and take it like a man, not try to run from it like a pussy. Once we're done, we're done. If a gun is put to your head, no trying to fight your way out of it. If you're shot, you're shot. If you fight this fight, you will fight this fight with honor, like an American, not some guerrilla warrior. You get shot, you're shot. You get taken, no arguing about it. If you argue, me and Jesse will kick your ass into the grass. Every team has to come, has to have one man on the POW camp at all times if there are prisoners. The camp has to have a guard. I looked at Cage, but there was no understanding of him at this point. No arguing with him. We were playing his game. He got to call it however he wanted to. I want this. Cage picked up a pistol and tucked it in his belt. And Jesse wants this. He grabbed his M16. The rest of you divide up what is left. We are going to go to our camp. We will wait five minutes. I looked at my Michael Jackson watch to mark the time. In five minutes, be ready to hell because I'm coming for you. 
when we got to the backyard, I didn't even ask questions. I didn't think. I just started thinking of what I was going to have my prisoners do while we were at camp. Now, don't think for a second that I thought we had a chance. I'm not saying that. I knew we had lost already. I knew there was no way the two of us could fight the entire neighborhood, but I was ready to do it if he wanted to, because Cage needed this. He needed a war to win to distract him from the one he was losing. I got the camp. You got a plan? I said. I'm going to bring them all in, he said. Don't you dare laugh when I tell you he rubbed mud all over his face. I'll be pissed if you make light of the fact that he took his belt, took off his belt and tied it around his head. This is not a story about a kid who wanted to be Rambo. This is the story about a kid who needed to be something powerful for once in his life. A story about a kid desperate, a kid being crushed by his life, unwilling to lay down and crack. Every few minutes, he dragged another one to me, gun to their head, shame on their face. I made them stack trash. I made them pull weeds. I made them take impossible rusted steel manual mower to mow the lawn. It took three of them to push the damn thing. I hit them. I yelled at them. I made them do push-ups and sit-ups. I made them do everything I could think of and more. And I even laid on a kid and made him do push-ups with me on his back. And Cage brought them in, one at a time, nine little boys. He took them all alive. That day, Cage was Rambo. And he walked off the field with a rocket launcher. To this day, I've never seen anything like it. Growing up post-Vietnam was <clears throat> it was really uh, surreal. America had won every fight, every war that I'd ever been in. This was the first time that America had lost a war. You can talk about loss, you can talk about retreat, you can talk about, we lost. We are not ready for this kind of warfare. I'm not gonna talk about Vietnam. I'll talk about what came after. For a while, um, America hated the troops. It was nobody's fault, I guess. There's, there's a lot of ex-military that would argue with that. But if you look at it from all different directions, you see the troops are forced to do a thing. Outside people that never should have been there in the first place were looking at what they were what the troops were forced to do and judging it the media just wanted a story vietnam vets were demonized and left to their own hell so many homeless so many suicides um, those that didn't found themselves unable to find a job. It took about, I don't know how many years, years for America to forgive what they had to do in order to fight that war and to re and to embrace the Vietnam vets. I just don't have the years for you. But I can tell you that what you're looking at when you're looking at uh, Vietnam vet is somebody who has been through PTSD, who has been through shell shock and is just trying to make sense of their life again. 
Now, this is not unique to Vietnam. We have the same thing in all of the wars that are fought all over the world. Walk up behind a soldier and you'll see PTSD. I have a friend who works at a, um, who worked before he retired, he worked at a, um, it was a mall and there was a crew of people that, uh, that were bringing something in. They did every weekend. And my friend was told, do not touch the back of this one particular guy who's carrying things into. Well, my friend was opening a door. The guy walks through. My friend touches his back. The guy spins around, ready to hit my friend in the face. Somebody grabbed them, pulled them out of the way. That's PTSD. You know, that's that funny thing that happens when a, um, a waiter or a waitress will drop something and it'll break and the whole crowd, the whole restaurant will clap as if they've accomplished something. Those with PTSD don't clap because as soon as we hear that thing break, we're thrown into a bad place. We shudder. We feel kicked to our chest. We feel endangered. And we're ready to scream or fight. Um, the reason why Scorch is important the reason why Scorch is a story I had to tell is because we're dealing with a person who has been through the Madness Wars. He's been through the Madness Wars. He's seen the horrors of, of war and he is trying to make sense of them. I'm gonna read you part of it. A lot of it's not gonna make sense. But this is pretty early in the book. Um, so I think that you'll be okay. Um, the chapter I've chosen to show you today is not as intense as my friend touching a man's shoulder and almost getting knocked out for it. It's not that intense. <clears throat> it's the slow pain of PTSD that I'm trying to show you today. So I'm gonna pause this. I'm gonna drink a little iced coffee. I think Rafe is about to wake up. I'm gonna see if he needs anything from me. Um, and then I'm going to come back and I'm going to read this. And after I read this, I, I don't know what happens next. I don't have this episode planned out. Um, like, like I said, I already had a video. I had a video recorded. Uh, me and my wife um, edited that video. It's already been um, exported from the editing software. It's ready to go. She can go on um, YouTube as soon as she wakes up, which I think I'm going to let her sleep until 11 because she was up late last night working on the cover of Scorch. I think I'm gonna 
let her sleep till 11. But if she got up at 11 right now, there's a video she could upload onto YouTube and it would be ready for you this Friday. But I decided this one comes first. Um, so I'm gonna take a break. Check my drink and uh, smoke a cigarette. See if my son needs anything before he goes off to bed, and then I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna <clears throat> I'm gonna read this chapter, and I hope this chapter will show the long-term effects of PTSD, the word. Or, you know, if you want the uncircumcised word, then shell-shocked. Um, so give me a minute before I go, I want to say today in celebration of Scorch, Guardian bought a knife. Um, I'll leave you with that. I'll be right back. Um, I'll be right back. There it is again. Guardian's trophy for putting out a book about PTSD. <clears throat> I've been through 19 new years of therapy. Somewhere around the 18 mark, I realized how PTSD was <clears throat> affecting my life. We were driving from Waynesville to Springfield. It's about an hour and 15 minute, hour and 30 minute drive. I'm passing a um, an old RV. I get right alongside the front driver tire of that RV and it pops. <clears throat> it didn't pop, it exploded. It sounded like a cannon going off. Becca screamed out. She freaked out. I never wavered. I never stopped. I kept going. The loud noise did not affect me after 19 years of therapy. Um, it didn't affect me. Uh, my body just kept going. And it, you know, that's a success. Maybe I've been healed from PTSD. Um, truth is, I heard that explosion for days, then weeks, then months. And I can hear it now. It's never left me. Each time my heart starts racing, my brain freaks out, <laughs> my body works on its own. PTSD never really goes away. It's part of your life and it's always gonna be. Hey, come in. I'm recording. Oh, thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, is part of your life and it never goes away. Uh, that was Rafe. Um, Rafe had to deal with a traumatic event last night. <clears throat> I was smoking, I put out my cigarette. <clears throat> I put the cherry of the cigarette into ash and I thought it would just go out and we left. We were gone for about 50. Uh, we, were, we were gone for about 40 minutes and we came back. I dropped Rafe off at the house. 
we went to go pick up dinner. He smelled smoke. He walked into the garage and the cigarette that I had put in had never gone out and it had started other cigarettes on fire. There's a small fire burning in the garage. Um, Rafe had the presence of mind to open the garage so that smoke would get out. And then he called us. He called us. He said, um, there's a small fire burning. Um, looks like there's some cigarette butts on fire. What do I do? And he poured a cup of water on it, and that was it. Um, he was calm, chilled out the entire time. Inside of him, liquid panic. That's where I'm at in my PTSD. He almost, he had a friend who almost got into a fight with another guy. That other guy had a friend. My boy was about to go in to back his if things got out of hand. Um, his friend goes in, fights the other guy. Maybe that guy's friend jumps in. My boy has to back him up. Um, he said within inside him, he was feeling terror. He was feeling fear. Um, it was, there were things going on in his body he couldn't control. He said he twitched. He was feeling the adrenaline that rushes through everybody's body when they're about to get into a fight. Outside, cold, calm. When I told, I told you about my friend who touched the guy's back, when that guy turned around, it was cold calm. Inside, he was back in Vietnam. Outside, it was cold calm that was determined to punch and crush anything that it was about to <laughs> that was behind it. You just go into a kind of automated response. How Rafe got there, I don't know. He's read all of Teardrop Road. He's read all of Noma Street. And he's read The Keep. Um, he has listened to stories that I've had to tell him for years beyond years. And he's lived with a guy who does things like this all his life. Um, Rafe possesses the cold calm of a man about to go into a panic situation. I've taught him control of his emotions. I've taught him control of his body. So I'm not saying that I have made him immune to PTSD. What I'm saying is that I suffer from it. I've taught him how to get around it. Rafe is cool all the time. No matter what's going on, he's totally calm. Me, <laughs> you can see right now, I'm rocking back and forth. When I'm smoking my cigarette, I'm doing like this. I have to move in order to self-soothe my, myself because of the PTSD. This is all very important and I needed to write a book about it. That's why Scorch. <clears throat> I'm gonna read the next chapter, uh, a chapter from Scorch. Um, I think this is 
the one that I want to read. Um, it's called Heat on the Trail. <clears throat> the caravan pulled into Searing Lake and was immediately crowded with nomads. This was one stop they made every year that was celebrated highly by the occupants. The dusty people danced and mumbled out the prayers of Genghis, god of merchants, for the return of the traitor. Weiss left from the wagon, leapt from the wagon, was completely surrounded by children who touched him and stroked him as if he were Devon. Tack felt as if he would be sick. Weiss knew the road the routes of the nomadic people of dead fight Cypher took. Every time the blue moon was full brought the people moving. They worked on a cycle that allowed the next group to come and take this place when they left. The Bring Up, Bring Up clan had been here for nigh on a month and were running low on supplies. Weez always waited for desperation to set in. When it seemed they would run out of vital supplies, he would show up just like today and gouge the men and women of the clan. Renga had always been good to Weez, always treated him like royalty, and Tack hated the way the traitor took advantage of them. Tack dropped from the cart and shouldered his bow. He moved into the tent city and down to the well dug there. Three guards stood watching, ensuring no one took too much. When they saw Tack, their faces broke in wide grins and then glass clasped their wrists in respect. They lowered their heads and stepped before Tack bowing low. The gesture always made him feel a bit uncomfortable, but he was taught by his father long ago that people needed heroes to survive the roughest times. He smiled through the discomfort and extended his arms in an em for an embrace. One at a time, they hugged him and patted him on the back. May take from the heart of Searing Lake, he asked quietly. The larger of them smiled and clapped his hands together loudly. Of course, mighty hawk, you may take as much as you need. Drown yourself in our life pool if you see fit. Tack nodded and descended the crumbling ladder to the water below. He reached the bottom and stood on the platform jutting fr up from the water. He took a small dipper from the bucket there and drank lightly. Sips, nothing more, though his body ached for him to drink heavily. He would not take much from the Bringa or any tribe of the other wandering clans. He took his water skin and filled it. The well was getting low. He could see the bottom and wondered how much longer Searing Lake would support the people of Dead Cypher. When he gathered what he could, he climbed out and was greeted by the matron of the clan's daughter. She was a stunning beauty with hair the color of fire. The song sun had long ago bleached the top to a rich yellow, the color of gold, though the roots and the layers within shifted to orange and then crimson. When the wind gathered and stroked her hair, her hair seemed to flame. Her eyes were dark as the night sky and her lips full, thick and full. Tack had not seen her in a year and he wondered if she missed him as he had missed her. She stared, gathering him, her up, gathering him up in her eyes. She devoured every detail of his face as a starving woman, finally before a meal that would save her life. She spoke not a word as she looked at him, and as if standing in his presence was healing some long wounded part of her. The guards chuckled, one placed a gentle hand on Tack's back and shoved him ever so lightly in her direction. Tack tried to think of Tosia tried to think of the way she felt with her arms around him and the way her body swelled as she breathed. But in the face of Pakloa, the traitor's daughter could not be found in a corner of his heart or his mind. The hawk has returned, Pakloa breathed. So lightly were her words spoken that the tack they seemed a kiss gentle and beguiling upon his ears. She stepped forward, hips swaying, and placed a hand upon his chest, his heart pounded frantically. He was sure she could feel it, and she smiled, a breezy light thing, as she touched him. Tack took her hand and gently pressed it against his chest a bit firmer. She opened her lips to speak, but did not say a word. He stared long and hard at those lips, wishing to kiss them and feel their swell between his lips, but the people of Dead Side feared did not kiss before marriage. 
Sex was permitted, and Tack had often been offered her body by her mother and father, but her lips were sacred. The moisture of a kiss was a thing too precious to be given to anyone. Will you stay when the traitor pulls away, she asked. Tack longed to tell her yes, longed to stay with her and move from the sacred spot to sacred spot with the bringa, but he had to keep from routine. He did not need to say the words. She knew them already. She took his hand in his and led him away. He walked past the pair caravan cart and knew Pakaloa had chosen this path purposely so he might pass Tezia. The trader's daughter saw them together and scowled in anger. She was busy trading buckles for trinkets that Weiss would sell to the people of the cities for outrageous prices, and she could not follow or make protests. Attack didn't care. Pakaloa was a wine he would savor rarely. She was need for him. She was a need for him, and he could not leave her side for a woman who fought to bind him with her body. He followed the romantic princess as she guided him to Searing Lake. The woman wore tight clothing cut away at the middle of the chest to expose her muscled belly. The long skirt flowed like water, hiding legs tacked new to be tight and lean. She took him out into, dry, into the dry lake where five women dug in the lake bed. Pakloa took him in far into the lake, past rocks and ravines, until they reached a caravan. They reached a cavern Tack had heard of, but never ventured to. The cave had once been underwater, and its walls were smooth and contoured. She led him to the inner caverns to the darkness there. She pulled a kaya bone from her hip and snapped it. The inner recesses of the bone began to glow, and she held it up, coloring the waters and floor green with the bone's eerie light. She set it down on a smooth stone that jutted from the ground. They sat on the floor of the cave. Join me, Hawk. Her words, ever so sweet, ever so gentle, did not echo on the walls around him. He sat and crossed his legs. She looked at him again and smiled. You'll be leaving us, never to return. This will be your last visit amongst our pe my people. She slipped her arms from her sleeves and pulled her shirt over her head. She gently set it on a stone beside the bone and sat unashamed and topless before him. You must make love to me now so I can move on. Tack's mind rebelled at what you were saying. Why do you think I will not return? Why do you think I will go away from you? I he heard the words coming from within and bit down on them. He did not have the luxury of speaking those words to him, to her. Speaking them now would be a torture to her. You love me, she said. Once the words were spoken out loud, he felt them radiate through his chest. He began to sweat. Even here in the coolness of the cave, he trembled and shook his head. I, I can't love you. You are being pursued, she said. His heart stopped. I did not know this until recently, she said, but there are those who are looking for you, those who would force something upon you. Tack shook his head against the truth and she nodded. I know this to be true now. I know you. why you will not marry me and taste my lips. You are fleeing from someone, you cannot stay with me. This I learned when he came asking for you. Tack jumped and moved for his feet. Her gentle hands stopped and cold. She shook her head. They've moved on, but they will be back. They know the traitor and of his caravan. They have heard of your power and your ability. They know it's you. They will not be satisfied with our poultry lies. I must go, Tack said. He moved to rise again and she pulled him back. You cannot, not yet. Stop and think and you will know this to be true. You must wait for cover of night. The traitor will follow if you do not. He will not let you escape. Make your way after dark has claimed the desert. Even then, you will need to employ our Tazas to escape. You will need the cover. Uh, you'll need a cover sheet, a way of masking yourself as you travel. You cannot make the horizon before sunrise. You'll be seen against the sky when we find, find you gone. If you wish to make a proper escape, you need my aid. 
Jack knew the words were true, but he did not want to believe them. You will help me, will you not? I will aid you, of course. If you look at me now and tell me you do not desire to partake of my body, look me in the eyes and claim to be callous to my body and my need. Claim I tempt you not, and I will help you escape. Do it not and learn my alliance with your body. You want me to make love to you. I want you to open me. Take what you desire and give me my only need. Long have you been away, I have bled and become a woman. I want to feel you within my body first before the other men fight and seek to open me. Take the only true gift I have to give. Part my willing legs, injure me before you run and never come back. I cannot. Why? She looked deadly serious. Do you look within your heart and find no love for me at all? Tat growled and shook his head. Oh, of course, I love you. I've loved you since your hair first sears, seared my eyes, but I'm not your man. I cannot take you as my wife. This is not the way of my people. We sex one another after the blood and after the, the bearing of manhood stands freely until we find our perfect match. Then a kiss seals them to us. We need our numbers to grow. And here in the unforgiving desert, many of our young died. Sex is a way of life for us. You will not be taking from another or making a promise to me you cannot keep. You will be opening me for the first time, as is my desire, and has been since I was nine and I saw you for the first time. Take me now. Give me my one desire, and I will carry you within me forever. I will not beg. A woman of my standing, a woman of my bloodline cannot do a thing like that. The bringer are a proud people. And as a member of the family of leaders, I cannot lower myself to tack ease forward. Her words stopped, her eyes widened as he scooted closer to her. I do, I do not know of sex or of taking a woman. When I think of such a thing, I feel only fear and apprehension. His words seemed to sigh from his body like a mirage off the desert floor. She moved forward, coming to her knees and leaning her back forward. Fear not when you take me. Fear is not what this meeting is about. My body I give in love before it is taken by others in need. Taste what I would give you freely. Tack pulled himself up to his knees and he gently wrapped his arms around her tight frame. Her skin was blazing hot and he felt as if he would, she would burn him alive. Her skin was soft from the oils they used to keep themselves hydrated. He felt her flesh like silk beneath his hands and he felt himself growing hard. She touched his body, pulling his shirt ever so slowly from his shoulders and over his head. She looked at him, her lips so close, her body giving off such heat, he sweat. He longed to kiss her, but that was a promise he could not make. He picked her up to her feet and untied the strings of her skirt. It fell like a curtain and he, he began to shake. He let her take over and eased into the body of the one he loved. <clears throat> they stood naked, looking out of the cave towards the darkening sky and Zach held her tight to his body. His first sexual experience had brought him to tears. She had slowly kissed away those tears and he felt they shared something more intimate because of it. He held her now and knew their time together was coming to an end. Do you remember when we met, she asked. It was the first time we brought me to the Ringa. Your people are resting at the depths and you were seated awaiting the first scar, he said. When I saw you, I thought you were some carving. You were so still and stayed that way for so long that I knew you couldn't be real. The scar were brought, Tak said, and were revived, still wiggling and fighting for freedom. The fish was cut open and its heart brought to you. When they placed it in your cupped hands and you moved, uh, I, I, I couldn't breathe. I felt you when your eyes first beheld me. Felt the power of your stare and the awe you felt in seeing me, she said. I longed to look for you in the crowd, but for the sake of the harvest, I could not. When that heart was placed in my hands, I did not eat at first. Do you remember? 
your eyes scan the crowd and you found me. That moment is when I loved you, she said. The smile you gave, I knew it was for me alone. I felt my heart taken away by you. And since I thought of you often, he said, can you tell me who came looking for me? He was a tall man, dark of skin with long black hair. His name is Harpo. He's the greatest hunter I've ever known. It will be him that finds me and takes me back. Back to where? Tack looked at her, knowing not whether to trust the truth to her or send her away with a lie. He knew she would sense a lie and he was wounded and be wounded by it. But if she knew, she might betray him. If she knew of his crime, she might turn on him and let her love for him sour. He needed her to love him as much as he needed to flee. He looked her in the eye and sighed. I killed a king, Tack said. She gasped before crushing her words with her fingers to her mouth and nodding. She looked at the darkening sky and laid his head, her head across his chest. Was the king a good man? I knew he would cry when he nodded. He was the best man I ever knew. Then why did you kill me? Kill him? It was an accident. I swear I would take it back if I could. He was weeping now. The tears choked him, locking away all words he needed to say. You are bound by this action, she said. The spirit of the one you would, you have killed haunts you. Until you make peace with it, you will be at odds. Until you turn and face it, you will always run from it. Tack, the time for you to face this spirit is now. Do not run from these people. I will stand beside you and face this with you, but I will not run. I will not be part of your cowardice. Stay here. When they come, we will face them together. We will endure their judgment, and I will claim you as my man. This thing will run from, from will eventually be your undoing. Stay with me and reclaim your life. The words sounded so good, refreshing after so many years of peering behind him in the dust of the caravan, scanning for those who would come for him. He was so tired, so ready to stop the chase. But the soft eyes of the one he left behind, he could not bear. He thought of the trial he demanded and the judgment handed down by his pack. He would never be able to allow that. Not an hour later, Tack stood on the edge of Searing Lake and stared out over the wide expanse of the desert before him. The moon colored the dunes on a myriad of shades that rioted and brought the land to chaos. He turned to her suddenly, unable to bear the thought of leaving her. Come with me, he begged. She would not cry. It was forbidden among her people. She strictly simply shook her head and placed her forehead against his. Come back one day, and if I have not claimed another, I'll be yours. I beg you, tack, turn, and face the spirit so we can be one. He knew he couldn't, and with that, he turned and headed off into the barren wasteland before him, leaving her behind him once more. Tack is a product of the Madden's Wars. Something happened in the Madden's Wars that will haunt him. All through the Book of Scorch and into the series. He is scarred by it. He's dealing with PTSD, with shell shock. Um, after the war, something haunts him. And there are people coming to look for him. The people won't hurt him if they find him. They'll just make him um, follow a sentence that he can't be a part of. Tack. Uh, Tack will run. And that's, that's what happens when you have PTSD. That's what happens when, you have, when you're shell-shocked. You run, you run from a, fat, from a past that you can't face. 
that you just don't have the strength to face. Um, this is why I wrote this book. All my books mean something. Scorch is about that nightmare that haunts you. The smack of the adult as it walks past a child that makes the child flinch deep into manhood, deep into womanhood. It's about the event so terrible that it scars the instinct of the person. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about PTSD, we're talking about a scarring of an instinct. That man walking past my friend, he knew that was my friend. He knew that man was harmless. He didn't have a weapon. He was not gonna hurt him. He kept walking. My friend touched his shoulder, but the instinct had been scarred and he spun and hit. With TAC, um, the instinct, his instinct has been scarred and he'll give up love. He'll give up his entire life to flee from it, to flee from the thing that he's most scared of. The Madness Wars talked about fathers. And by the end of publishing The Madness Wars, I found out why. But those of you that have followed this channel know that by the end of The Madness Wars, I found out that the man that I had been told was my father wasn't and that I had a different father who was already dead. The Madness Wars brought me to that end and taught me about that. Scorch is a book about PTSD. It's a book about the after effects of war. <clears throat> Name your war. Vietnam, Desert Storm, your childhood, your education, name your war, maybe your marriage, the thing that has scarred your mind, your body, and your instinct. Name the war that makes it so that Guardian can pull this from his pocket and have it open and ready to fight in less than a second. Because when you read Scorch, you have to face it. You have to face whatever that is. Whatever that was that hurt you, and that, that, that harmed you, that burned your mind, your body, and your instincts. When you read Scorch, you'll face it. And hopefully, after 19 years, I have written a book, 19 years of therapy, I have written a book that can help you. Hopefully, I've written a book that can help you through your PTSD. Um, or at least get you started on the path to healing. <clears throat> this, uh, this episode was a shock to me. Um, I needed to speak on October 5th about the book that I had released. I guess it's been out for seven hours now. I know at least one person that's read all the way through it. <laughs> so.
Scott, I hope will walk you through the beginnings of your healing of PTSD. The next book in the series will heal you more. If it doesn't, or even if it starts you on that healing path, I suggest if you have PTSD, if you have what will be called shell shock. If a man touches you on the back and you turn to fight him, even if you know he's harmless. If you find yourself timing how fast you can pull a blade from your pocket. If you find yourself rocking back and forth while you're talking to people or while you're supposed to be at rest. If you find a blown tire haunts you for years and you'll hear that explosion over and over in your head. If you find yourself in that position, um, I hope Scorch can help you take the first steps towards finding peace. Um, do all the things, but but after this episode, that seems silly. Um, thanks for coming.